This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. I think everybody has a story of either a, a, a family member or a friend who has had mental health issues, addiction, or a, a opioids crisis. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm one of those too. Yeah. yeah, we all do. And I think unless we as a community address this issue. I think this problem will continue to be an issue. main thing is the religion. The religion that they're in, they know that what they're doing and what they're taking is forbidden. Humanity in general has always looked for uh, pain relief. The opioid crisis in the U.S. is equal opportunity. It's affected people and communities everywhere. Yet resources that raise awareness about it or provide tools for intervention are not equally available. That's especially true for folks whose primary language is something other than English or who adhere to non-Judeo-Christian or quote-unquote American cultural values. Existing data around the opioid crisis' impacts, be it in numbers or in story form, fall short in capturing the epidemic's effects among people in our ethnic communities. A new coalition called the Ethnic Communities Opioids Response Network Missouri, or ECORN, has formed in the St. Louis area to address what's missing around those much-needed resources and data. Here to talk with us about that organization and its goals and how its work sets a precedent beyond local ethnic communities, we welcome Sal Valadez, founder and board chair of ECORN. Sal also works with the Laborers International Union of North America Midwest Region and the Missouri and Kansas Laborers District Council. He serves as diversity outreach uh, and marketing representative. Sal, it's great to meet you finally. Thank you, Elaine. Great to be here. We also have Adil Imdad. Adil is a co-founder and board member of ECORN and serves as social services director for the Islamic Foundation of Greater St. Louis. He's also the chairman of the West Pine Mosque inside St. Louis University. Welcome to you as well, Adil. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you both for coming to talk with us today. So, Adil, why is it that you were interested in being a founder of this coalition and then part of it? So um, I have been dealing with social services and the refugees uh, in this city since 1995 and with the funerals for the last nine years, since 2014. And I have seen many, many uh, youth uh, dying of this problem, of this sometimes committing suicide, sometimes going to depression, and then taking fentanyl overdose, drug substance overdose, and then committing suicide. And uh, so that, uh, so I was thinking for a long time that, you know, what is the solution for that? So when Sal talked to me about it and uh, I just hopped right in, you know, I said, this is something that I'm really looking for it. Even though before that, we were already doing efforts on our own, like having meetings and seminars at the mosques, at different mosques with the Bosnian community, Arab community, and trying to train and teach the youth uh, not to get into this problem, you know, trying to uh, reach out to the high school, college students not to get into this problem. Mm -hmm. But I felt that uh, it was very difficult to reach out to them because most youth who were in it, they were not even attending the mosque. They were not coming for prayers. They were not coming and attending these seminars. They were in their own world. Right. So unfortunately, it was very difficult to get to them. So I believe through ECORN, uh, we'll have ways and, you know, more time and money and, you know, uh, to get to these people uh, besides the mosque, going to neighborhoods. So, and that's where we really want to end up and uh, fix this problem. Yeah. So, is there something very personal about this to you? I mean, I know that there are connections that have to do with the the long time that you've worked with uh, laborers, but... Is there something else? Like, why why found this and put so much energy uh, and resources of your own into it? Well, it's both personal and professional. Prior to this, I worked in uh, as an executive director of 
several nonprofits and as an, uh, in, in higher education. And I've always asked the question in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion is who's missing and why? Uh, or who's being left behind and why? And this was very true during uh, COVID uh, because we were asked as communities to participate with our departments of public health and doing research and translations. And it became obvious to me that systemically, uh, public health in general, healthcare in general, there is a, a lack of resources and funding uh, f to take care of our communities in terms of culture, language, and, and, and other, uh, other uh, variables. And so we've been advocating and, and we're, we're, we're being heard now uh, by our leaders, uh, our, our elected officials, and our uh, directors of public health uh, for that need, and we're working with them to resolve those issues. So that's the central question. Who's being left behind and why? Adil, you, know, you are among 11 eCorn founders and 16 board members. That is a lot of people. But your work put the issue of opioid substance um, abuse disorder before you in a couple of different ways, before eCorn officially formed, and that's been through um, APNA Clinic, which is a free clinic in the city that you co-founded, as well as your time directing social services, right, at the Islamic Foundation of Greater St. Louis. How is it that you see eCorn on the ground level, helping groups and organizations like the ones that you are involved with? I think eCorn will be very beneficial to us and we have been having meetings, and this is something that I was looking for for a long time. Uh, I also do funerals uh, at the Islamic Foundation. We do about 140 funerals of Muslims per year, and social services, so we are heavily involved with uh, refugees, immigrants, people who are you know, struck with poverty, and helping them out. So we run into many of those refugees and immigrants who are going through this problem mm -hmm. and their deaths are happening because of that uh, fentanyl opioid uh, crisis. Right. So this is the way I wanted to join that and uh, uh, actually I thank Sal for thinking of me and asking me to be a board member on the eCorn. Yeah. Now, another active eCorn founder is Alden Lolich, who also started the Bosnian Opioid Project in 2019 in response to a trend that he was seeing but wasn't openly acknowledged. He said there was one particular incident in conversation that drove home how serious the issue of opioid addiction had become in his community. We had, at that time, was a 22-year-old uh, that overdosed. And um, as I was, I was on, on my way actually meeting Sal Valadez uh, and, and my friends from Leona, from the labor local union, through conversations with him, I was also aware that they had acquired an issue with, with uh, construction workers at that time, you know, being overworked, long hours that would result into a lot of pain medication. And then, you know, we all know what's the next step. They start looking for uh, stronger drugs. And... Um, I was on my way to one of the mornings on my way to to a meeting, and I ended up I ended up calling one oh, a friend of mine. I'm asking because you know thinking that you know he must be aware of what's really happening because he's in charge of printing out death certificates and uh, arranging uh, 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 funerals, etc. So I've asked him on my way on my drive to the meeting. I've asked him. What, what is the, I mean? I've seen this happening. You know, I've, I've been to one or two funerals lately. Uh, overdoses. Um, no one's still really talking about it. But what do you what do you see? I mean, what what is the number? Like let's say five five six years last five six years number of overdoses, and he said to me, seven or eight. And I said, oh, well, you know, seven or eight. I mean, it's bad. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't I be even one? But seven and eight. I mean, comparing, I was thinking in 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 terms of you know, bigger picture, you know, misery and seven and eight. It's, and he said, no, seven, eight a year. So that's that's when it really struck me. Lulich also pointed to the interplay and sometimes the tangle of language, communication channels, and cultural norms and expectations that makes dealing with opioid use in Bosnian families difficult. The, the parents, I mean, they understood enough 
but then they still had to rely on their children, and their children were the ones that were involved with drugs. So they they were only preview to information to what they wanted to tell them. And um, so not understanding, not having any translated material, not knowing where the resources were, any of that. And, and so it was pretty much, pretty, they were pretty much relying on their children to, for any of that. And then um, religious uh, religious beliefs would also hinder uh, seeking help uh, outside the community. And as, as an ethnic community, we even though Bosnians are considered as Caucasian, but we still have our, you know, we carry our we, we carry our traditions and our culture with where we go, and, and that's uh, uh, the stigma. It's, it was very present in the community. Mm-hmm. No one wanted to talk about it. That was Alden Lolich, founder and chair of the Bosnian Opioid Project, and one of the co-founders and board members of Ecorn Missouri. As we're listening to this, um, Adil, what comes to mind for you? Families who go through that, they're extremely, extremely sad, sorrowful, very unhappy, and they actually do not want to talk about it. And uh, one of the examples that comes to my mind is um, once around uh, 11 p.m., I got a call from a brother from uh, North County, and he said that he went to the basement and he found his son unresponsive. So um, he was only 24 years old. He told me he was religious, so he meant that, you know, it's probably not overdose. So uh, we, I mean, sent the drivers and picked up the body and did the funeral, and he did not want to talk about it. But once the death certificate showed up, it, it showed the cause of death as fentanyl, fentanyl overdose. And when he saw that, he started crying because he could not believe that his son could do that. Mm-hmm. And then he asked me if you could please not talk about it in the community. And of course, we never reveal anybody's name or you know who they are and where they're from and things that happen to them. This is pretty unfortunate. So we try to keep it to ourselves. Yeah. And that's part of the stigma that we feel in the community. Yeah. Sal, you were kind of nodding as you were listening to um, Alden speak there. What was it that that stood out to you? Well, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's um, funny how things are all interrelated. Life is very unpredictable, and sometimes it's unpredictable in a very good way. Um, in 2017, I uh, joined... Uh, Dr. John Gall, who at that time was the director of uh, training for uh, the Carpenters Union, and my good friend uh, Don Willie, who was uh, the business manager for Labor's Local 110. And um, as it's very public, uh, it's known, John Gall lost his son to um, uh, to suicide. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, Don Willie, a short time later, lost his son to opioid, uh, an opioid overdose. And uh, we met at a forum at Washington University on this exact topic, and we began working uh, with different entities, including uh, BJC, the medical school at Washington University, to address this problem from our perspective, our personal, because it's, it's, nobody's immune. I think everybody has a story of e- either a, a, a family member or a friend who has had mental health issues, addiction, or uh, uh, opioids crisis. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm one of those too. Yeah. yeah, we all do. And so, uh, it, it uh, from that we began working. At, we were also at the time uh, developing a relationship with the uh, the Bosnian community. They came to us, and and we met with. Uh, I think it was seven imams and, and other community leaders because this this crisis was just they they could not they could not address it. So we began working there. We connected with Prevent Ed. Prevent Ed is also represented in our board, sure. and and they have wonderful resources. Kristen Bankston and Stacy Zell and Nicole Dawsey. They're all committed to uh, uh, providing us with the resources uh, that they they have to help us address those issues in the community. Yeah. And we've spoken with um, very many of the people that you've mentioned here because the conversation around 
um, substance use disorder is is one that we've been following and really does touch all communities. Adil, is there something though, you know, as you were talking about stigma about this father who did not want um, want others to know what had happened, is there something that's really important to understand about stigma regarding um, opioid and other you know substance use disorders among Muslims who are part of you know, immigrant ethnic communities? I mean, because not all Muslims are from immigrant or, or ethnic you know, enclaves mm-hmm. or, or communities. So what is it important to note here? So, you know, the in the Muslim community, first of all, the religion Islam itself forbids um, any drugs, alcohol, mm-hmm. or any substance that can make you uh, in act that way that you know you're kind of high. Alter your, yeah, your, it's, yeah, your state reason. of consciousness, right. So it, Islam forbids that. So that's already a no-no. And on top of that, um, you know, for the youth, the uh, here the American culture here, they... Um, the American culture also, of course, the teachings here in the college, that's, you know, we are trying to f- forbid that so people will not come into this problem. But uh, when that happens, it just hits them twice because, you know, once they are Muslims and they don't want to show their, uh, they're dishonored, basically. They're, you know, disrespected. They don't want to show their face in the community. If community finds out and they feel very kind of disrespected mm-hmm. and uh, disgraced, so that's the reason they don't want to talk about that and they don't want to even uh, be known that one of their child has done that. Right. So that's one of the reasons that, you know, that they, you know, that that's a part of the shame, you can say, that yeah. comes to the family. And is there some way that, um, that opioid addiction in particular, that it is associated with, like, American culture and that that is part of the reason it is not spoken about uh you know more more openly or or willingly well i think i think uh that uh humanity in general has always looked for uh pain relief and mental relief you know that's just humanity um, but in the United States, unfortunately, we are the number one nation for the consumption of both legal and illegal substances. And so uh, that's not a distinction we were, we're, we're proud about, but it's, it's reality and we needed to, to, to be uh, more inclusive in terms of the, uh, of, of the issues. In the construction industry, for example, the reason I'm involved with my colleagues in the construction industry is because we have, we're ranked number one and number two for suicide, um, either one and number two for different categories that include mental health uh, issues, uh, addiction, suicide, uh, overdose, uh, and and everything that's related to that. It's a strain. It's about this issue is about individuals. It's about families and friends. It's about communities, and it's also about workforce. Mm -hmm. So we uh, we are working together with different uh, organizations to address this issue. We are going to take a very quick break here, but we're going to return to this conversation and pick up um, with stigma when we come back. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. Welcome back. Sal, so far we've talked about language and culture and that component of what ECORD is advocating for. And we've also touched upon uh, stigma and how that is attached to even acknowledgement of opioid substance use disorder 
in ethnic communities like the Bosnian community, as Alden Lolich has described, and Adil, what you have also talked about. Now, another key to Ecorn's work has to do with its health-focused approach. St. Louis-based cardiologist and Salam Clinic co-founder Dr. Zia Ahmad joined Ecorn to address the denial of and the issues stemming from chemical dependency. And he says it doesn't get talked about enough. Often, he says, when there's a death or a major health problem stemming from addiction, families are at pains to come up with an explanation for what's going on. Sometimes because they genuinely believe that it was not a substance abuse problem, and sometimes even if they're aware, they don't want that to go around. And I think unless we as a community address this issue, and I think I've seen some progress in that there have been some instances in which uh, the mental health uh, leaders in our community, may they be psychiatrists or psychologists, have started talking about it and started to address this problem. Mm-hmm. Unless that is done in a more robust manner, I think this problem will continue to be an issue. That was Dr. Zia Ahmad, one of Ecorn's co-founders and board member and director of Salam Clinic. Now, Ecorn is certified by the Missouri Department of Mental Health, but his comments capture something vital about why Ecorn is advocating explicitly for public health response to the opioids epidemic among communities. Is is that just something that I'm getting, or is that really you know, part of the, the motivation um, that he has had in, in joining your work? Oh, absolutely. And I think people, as I mentioned earlier, uh, fail to see the connection between individuals, families, communities, uh, workforce, and also violence in our communities. There's a connection to all of these issues. But of course, one of our uh, Two biggest barriers that we have is the adequate funding and the uh, in the uh, uh, collaboration, which we're working on, uh, to uh, engage our communities down to the grassroots level. Uh, the other thing is is you know my friend Brandon Anderson, who is the vice president of safety for the AGC uh, Missouri. Uh, he's been working on this. Uh, on this issue in terms of our our construction industry. And in a recent workshop, he says, our biggest challenge is to normalize discussions about these issues. And uh, the challenges are the stigma, the fear, the marginalization of people. Uh, And so if we normalize uh, conversations about mental health and, and this specific crisis related to opioids, I think that's one of one of the goals that we have, and I think we will move the move uh, the the solutions along related uh, to to this crisis. Mm-hmm. Adil, do you happen to have an anecdote or example of you know how or why you know taking a very health focused approach to talking about opioids among folks you know in the the Muslim community? how that that works and maybe gets around some of the the stigma that does exist yeah it comes down to the health issues you know most of the people that i deal with they are refugees in the sources and they come from war-torn countries and they already have ptsd issues like stress you know uh, uh, poverty and when they come to this society they have to you know go around, start working, and uh, they have culture barriers, language barriers, religion barriers, and that problem kind of exacerbates. And uh, mm-hmm. some of them go to depression. Some of them, you know, they have multiple other issues, and the depression leads them to substance abuse, right, and substance right. abuse leads them to suicide. So, I mean, it, it boils down to their health issues. And uh, definitely, I also work with some psychiatrists, uh, who give us a lot of time in our free clinics and they show up, take uh, patients, walk-in patients, and they try to give them uh, the best sport, even psychological sport and psychiatric sport with medicine. And it has helped a uh, few families that I know mm-hmm. who are on the verge of collapse. It helps. It definitely has helped them. And is part of that because it is pinned to something that's going on with the health versus some kind of failing of of morality? Mm-hmm. 
yes, you know, the, the, it, so unfortunately, like uh, like I said before, that uh, main thing is the religion. The religion that they're in, they know that what they're doing and what they're taking is forbidden. Like we say haram in Arabic language, which is something illegal to take, which is illegal to uh, ingest mm -hmm. or drink. So they're already in that stigma, they're already in that fear. And on top of that, if they die of that, it just you know adds up to the problem mm -hmm. for them. They don't want to be known in the community for that, right. definitely, because they would probably be looked down upon, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. now, the Bosnian Opioid Project founder and chair, Alden Lolich, he spoke to two issues that are related specifically to the accuracy of data, and that is part of what ECORN um, exists to address. One of them pertains to categories and numbers, and the other to records and stories. Bosnians identify as, as being Europeans uh, uh, as Caucasians, so we are, lump, we are lumped in into the, the large uh, uh, group of you know, Caucasians. So when if someone asks me what's the number of all those it's in any community, it's really hard to tell uh, because we are lumped into a Caucasian uh, 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 group. And another, another issue that I've actually seen throughout these years working is uh, uh, that death certificates would not be, and that's a clear, but the, the parents have the right to choose what to use as cause of death. And many times it would be uh, unknown. It would not say overdose or anything like that. I understand to a point. Uh, so that's unless someone's very close to the family or unless you know, we hear from someone from the mosque, we you know, a lot of times we really don't know what the actual cause of death is. A deal. Yeah, so uh, talking from my own experience from the burials um, and the funerals that we do at the Islamic Foundation, uh, we do about one to two uh, cases per month. It has increased way, way too much. Wow. Right? Uh, back in 2014 when we started this funeral home, uh, hardly, I mean, the whole year I did not get a single a death certificate that shows, you know, substance abuse. But now, 10 years later, nine years later, it's just uh, about, you know, one to two cases every month. And uh, we cannot yeah, discuss that, uh, even in the death notification. Uh, the families don't want to show that. And the death certificate, of course, we give them uh, uh, privately, mm -hmm. so nobody can see that. Yeah, so then what happens when it comes to things like obituaries? Uh, is is it just skipped over entirely? Yeah, it's just totally skipped over, or they don't do obituaries. Uh, That's totally, a good yeah, thing to know, yeah. Right, they don't, uh, I mean, in, in our religion, the, the funeral process is very straightforward. Yeah. We don't even do embalming, we don't do, uh, you know, uh, eulogies or obituaries. We, if somebody wants to do it, they can do it on their own, but uh, officially, our funeral home and our mosque does not do that. Mm -hmm. So, it just stays... Uh, in people's mind, in people's right. heart. And so, Sal, the, the first part of what Alden had said about numbers, um, and that is something that is important to talk about because data is part of what ECORN is focused on, and that is directly tied to resources. How is it that Bosnians being lumped in with white people affects access to resources? Elaine, this goes back to the question about who's being left behind and why. Uh, when we look at the data, when we looked for the data uh, related to our ethnic and cultural language communities, um, it was very difficult to get any. We know at a national level that the trends are for increases in all communities, all race and ethnic communities. It's an increase that is not turning around anytime soon. So opioid use, suicide, all these issues, uh, overdoses, uh, are continuing to grow. But when you look at the at the at the level, let's say in our region, in the county, and in the the city, um, you look at the dashboard uh, of of overdose mortality, overdose and mortality. Uh, it's lumped into, or it's presented as a black and white issue. Mm -hmm. But if you were to disaggregate that data, let's say using the data from the East-West Gateway of Governments, who has an excellent 
uh, data source and maps and everything on the LEP communities. Limited the, English Yes, the limited, yes, mm -hmm. the data is there. Uh, you would find in the black and white communities, uh, the Bosnians in the white community and other LEP communities that identify as white. And in the black communities, you have the the people, our, our friends, our immigrant communities from countries like Africa who identify as black. And they also have significant numbers of uh, limited English speakers in their communities. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a matter of bringing data together. Uh, the data is there. What isn't there is, um, is, is the data related to opioids. So the map for the city and the county, sh the maps show where the overdoses are happening by zip code and mortality by zip code. The LEP maps show where the uh, language, uh, English, limited English uh, speakers live. And if you overlay those two maps, you'll find the highest concentrations are in LEP communities. Mm -hmm. So there's something happening there. So what yeah. we're, we're advocating for is adv uh, uh, if the, um, if the, um, the quantitative data isn't there, then we should engage with our research partners uh, to to do qualitative data. In other words, actually getting out in our communities, collaborating with Adil, uh, Alden, myself, and other folks to get down into the community and provide the surveys. The stories are as important as the data. Absolutely. And because and why is data important? And data drives research. Research drives policy, funding, and programs. Mm -hmm. And there's a clear connection between the lack of the resources that we that we have in our LEP communities because of that disconnect. Yeah. Now, the second part of what Alden Lolich had mentioned is relevant to data in this in the way that we've just talked about, Sal. That the qualitative kind is absolutely critical, and yet it can be so hard to gather. Um, in part because of stigma, you know, and then there are language barriers, but the stigma in particular is is a big thing. And he also related an anecdote about going to a funeral for a girl whose death was caused by a drug overdose. And he had said that everyone in the community knew that, but his father had said that his daughter had taken too much cough syrup. Now, Dr. Zia Ahmad says the more we talk about substance use disorder, the more others will feel comfortable sharing what they've been going through. And he recalls a time he was at a gathering of physicians where a doctor stood up and spoke openly about his experience of losing his son. That one instance brought this discussion out from something which is private between friends and family out into an open forum. And that group uh, who was there was able to listen to the story, feel about it, and go back and talk about it to others in an open fashion as well. So I think that did a lot. I mean, I, I, I hats off to that father who was able to get beyond his pain and for the good of the community, address it in a public manner. That is how this becomes normalized. Normalized not in the sense that this is normal, normalized in the sense that there is no shame to it. This is a chemical imbalance problem. It is no different from hypertension or high cholesterol or diabetes. It is something that needs to be recognized, addressed, and treated. Now, Adil, is engendering this kind of sharing that Dr. Zia has um, talked about which improves the qualitative data and in turn supports resources. Is that a big part of the reason that you've put your time and energy behind eCorn? Yes, that's one of the reasons. And also with the qualitative data, uh, yes, it will improve the qualitative data if people will come out and speak. But unfortunately, like I said before, it's going to be very, very difficult for the Muslims to speak out, mm -hmm. uh, especially for their own families. Yeah, I've just had a, a funeral of a young man, about 28 years old, and he was unresponsive in his basement, and his sister called me 
and she asked me, please, Mother Adil, do not tell anybody how he passed away. So she already knew, you know, uh, you know, the instant that she saw him, she knew the reason. And uh, uh, she asked me exclusively not to talk about it. Yeah. So we cannot talk about it. Uh, we cannot tell anybody. Mm-hmm. And it has to be just hush hush, you know. Yeah. And, and therefore, qualitatively, you cannot, you know, uh, you know, put quantity. Mm-hmm. But speaking on statistics and uh, quantity, I can tell you the the community that's more affected by this is the Bosnian community, mm-hmm. and the, uh, they're of course Muslims, and uh, they also don't want to talk about it. But they are a little bit a little bit more liberal than the other Asian Muslim, for example, or okay. African Muslim or Arab Muslims. They would sometimes talk about it, but on the other hand, the African, the Middle Eastern, the Asian Muslims. They're pretty uh, quiet about that. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad that you've pointed that out because as Sal had mentioned earlier, none of these groups is it a monolith. There are sub sub groups within these different communities. Sal, you had something to add? Y- yes. Uh, uh, we are, uh, well, two things. The, uh, regarding stigma, uh, the Addiction Policy Forum um, reached out to me two days ago and they said, we are in the process of of developing stigma materials that we're going to roll out. And we want to know the other language materials, uh, what are your two priorities? And I've been working with the Afghani uh, community, and I said Pashto and Bosnian. So we're going to be Mm -hmm. bringing those materials forward uh, very soon. In terms of the qualitative data, uh, there is a way, if we team up with uh, researchers, let's say at WashU or SLU or whoever, to make design a uh, collection method that honors uh, the, uh, the privacy, uh, the do no harm piece. Mm-hmm. In other words, I, I think working with our people like with a, a, like Adil and, and Alden and all of our board members representing these or, uh, communities, we can develop a research project to collect that qualitative data without doing harm to the the, the individuals or communities. Mm -hmm. And the final question for each of you very briefly, I mean, what will need to happen so that you know that these efforts are working, Adil? Well, we will have to see the quality uh, and we have to see, you know, how uh, the the cause of death, for example, you know, that tells us the quantity uh, in, in, in the death certificate. And we'll find out if, you know, our reaching out efforts are working. Mm -hmm. And uh, if these people who are in this crisis, are they coming to the mosques? Are they coming to the seminars? Are they coming frequenting uh, with the imams, sitting with them and and learning? And if we see that, and definitely that will tell us that, you know, quality and quantity is getting better. Yeah, yeah. So. Mm. Well, I I think what's going to, what for me is going to uh, show progress is w- when we develop comprehensive uh, community engagement and collaborative efforts between public health, health care, and our grassroots community, and we actually see funding come to our grassroots communities to be part of the solution because public health in itself uh, will not be able to address uh, this crisis and, and any future crisis if, number one, we don't have the resources. So so it has to be a, a concerted effort between uh, organizations and uh, the public health, for example, uh, addressing the continuum of this crisis in terms of, uh, of education, prevention, treatment, and recovery. Sal Valadez is the founder and board chair of Ecorn Missouri, and Adil Imdad is an Ecorn co-founder and board member. He's also the social services director for the Islamic Foundation of Greater St. Louis. Sal and Adil, thank you so much for joining us today. Elaine, thank you so much. Thank you, Elaine. And throughout this conversation, the issue of suicide has come up. We do want to make sure to mention that help is available 24-7. The Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is 988. You can text or call 988. This episode was produced, recorded, and edited by Emily Woodbury. Podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. 
St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. St. Louis on the Air proudly supports local artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com.